Well, hi, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me in my shop here. It's August 11th, a beautiful sunny day here. So I'm liable to make this kind of quick. Well, we'll see what happens. So I have another oscilloscope. Oh my gosh, how many of these have I got? So what happens to me, occasionally, not, not with any regularity, but occasionally people have stuff like this and they want to get, literally get rid of it. Maybe they're moving or something and they just want to get rid of this and they don't want to throw it in the garbage. So they cast around for someone to, I'm sorry to say, kind of dump it on. And I end up showing up now and then. So this kind of got dumped on me here. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to keep this stuff out of the dump also. Uh, but I have too many of these, let's be honest with you. <laughs> Including, I have, I have a Dumont. How many people have a Dumont oscilloscope? Similar in age to this one. Maybe much older. It's a very early scope. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at this guy. I'm going to consider uh, operating it and checking it out to see if it actually operates. So, yeah, let's put a little more light on it. Okay, so it's an ICO. Uh, so I, I believe ICO produced good test equipment, uh, moderately priced for people like a radio repairman and people like that who weren't big bucks people running a big laboratory, but had a repair shop similar to what I've got here. And this would be an ideal piece of equipment uh, for them. So I think that's what this is. I don't think it's the top of the line. Well, it might be the top of the Eichel line, but it's not. It's not a top of it. It's not not of the kind of quality like like uh, a Tektronix or Hewlett Packard or something like that. Um, so it's a uh, let's see, vertical input, and there's a uh, there's a grounding clip, clip here between these two inputs, so you could remove the ground connection. You could have an ungrounded input. That's interesting. Um, this, this feels like it's ready to, it is, it's ready to come out. Okay, well, we'll probably do that in a minute. That means there's no screws in the back? Yikes. Um, it would look though like it's a single input. Here's the uh, z-axis, which is basically the brightness. And by putting a signal into the z-axis, you can get a variation in the brightness, which can allow you to see things in a way you can't see them otherwise. But Many radios, uh, radios, many scopes have a Z input, but it's often right on the very back of the scope. There's, uh, there's nothing back here. Nothing at all on the back. So we have intensity. Where's the on-off switch? Scale light. Where's the on-off switch? Focus. Vertical and horizontal positions. Where, where's the on off switch? <laughs> uh, this is the horizontal gain. Sync sweep. 60 hertz. External plus and minus. Horizontal input, external sync. So you could put your own sync signal in here. Hmm, 60 cycles and external. So this will be hooked up to here. The vertical gain control. AC here, DC here. 1000 volts per division, I suppose is what that means. One volt per division, so it doesn't go very, uh, that's odd, it doesn't, it doesn't go down to 0.1 volts and below. Sweep, sweep selector, external, this is external cap here, come a little closer, it's got some weird stuff on it here, that's a little better. external cap K 
can't get it to point at the 10. Well, that's odd how they have that written, isn't it? You've written like 10K, it's between these two dots. So 100K, TV, vertical, and horizontal triggering, I guess, for vertical signals and horizontal signals in a television set. So that's got to be 100K, 10K, 1K, 100, 10. External cap. Okay, I don't know what that is. Sweep adjustment here, a vernier phasing. So phasing, I think, would have something to do with the TV settings here for the sweep. Oscilloscope DC, well, that's good, to wide band. Well, they don't want to admit, <laughs> admit it. Wide band, model 460. Where's the on-off switch on here? <laughs> Maybe it's a pull-on. It's a pull-on. I'm, I'm pulling. How did I? How did I miss the? Here it is. Here it is. There. Okay. Good. It's a good thing to know how to turn these things off. Electronic Instrument Company. Ico. Electronic Instrument Company. I never knew what ICO stood for. Okay, uh, Brooklyn, New York. For balanced input, remove the jumper. And they're talking about this ground jumper here. Well, any reason why we shouldn't turn this on? Well, because the screws are out, let's pull it out of its cabinet and take a look. <laughs> Maybe somebody's been in here and they've stolen all the vacuum tubes out of it. Who, who knows? <laughs> let's take a look. You had better step back. <laughs> this guy's old. Looking pretty rough. ones here. And I don't think there's any doubt they've been replaced. Using 300 ohm cable to make some connections. Another one here. Oh, it's not, you know, usually these oscilloscopes are just loaded with vacuum tubes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. That's not very many. I've got eight, nine. There's another one over here. I've got uh, scopes that have 30 vacuum tubes in them. Another more down here? They wouldn't. Oh my gosh. So these look replaced. Hmm. webs and stuff in here. Whew. All I'm thinking about, wow, you turn this guy on? Really? Lots of high wattage resistors all through here. tubes seem to be in place and uh, it looks like it's ready to go. What? You know, I have ways of turning these things on to protect the uh, or uh, control the amount of power going into them. These are 
thousand volt capacitors here. 0.1 thousand volt. And this vacuum tube has only three three wires connected to it. Uh, it's not qualify as off. Maybe that's a, would that be a voltage regulator. It would be like that. What well, would have only three wires hooked up to it? A one V two. What are they doing? So often in these instruments, vacuum tubes are used in. Uh, I'd say, I would say unusual, maybe that's a good word for it, unusual ways, or ways that are very different from how they'd be used in an amplifier or a radio. And uh, Also, it's quite possible some of these tubes are very unusual. 6AX5 rectifier back there, I think that's a rectifier. Well, really only I think one decent way to find out if this works and that's just to plug it in and turn it on and find out and as I mentioned I have ways of controlling the power rather crude crude ways back behind Ganesh here is uh, two light bulbs and those two light bulbs uh, can be switched into the power supply circuit and go into this outlet in such a way that any electricity getting to the outlet has to actually go through the filament of the light bulb, a little, a little like like a fuse in a sense. Yeah, very much like a fuse. This is also uh, connected to an isolation transformer. Just so you're aware of what I'm doing here. If you want to know more about these lights, you can look up dim bulb system on the internet find out about it. Now let's just practice up a little bit here before we turn this on. Um, so we'll put the sweep kind of in a middle setting here. This is 10k. I mean 10,000 sweeps per second. And put the vertical gain halfway. Phasing, put it on zero here. Horizontal gain, put it straight up. Sweet vernier should probably be sitting at 100 normally. And the synchronization sweep, I'm not sure what I'm doing there. Horizontal gain. Horizontal selector. Sync sweep. We'll just put it on plus and leave it like that. And then the vertical gain. There's a calibrate setting right in the middle here. Calibrate and then it's DC this way, AC that way. So we'll go DC, 100 volts. There won't be any signal going into it at first. What we're hoping to get is just a trace across the screen. Kind of a dirty actor. Okay, are we ready? So um, this, uh, but not not a huge number of tubes. I think I'm going to undo one light bulb here. It's going to force all the power through this other light bulb that you can barely see there. That's probably going to come on quite bright and it's going to hold the voltage down, way down. So this thing's going to get 50, 60 volts or something like that. And we'll, we'll go from there. I think we're just about ready here. Just trying to think of, think, trying to think of what I'm not thinking of. That's tricky business for us, for us people. Okay, I think I'm okay. So this is switched off. Apply the power. The power is being directed through the, the light. Of course, there's nothing going there because it's turned off. Here we go. What will happen? Lights come on very bright as expected. And it's, it's dimmed down a long ways. So that's a sign that something is changing in the scope. Oh, that didn't sound good. Something really changed in the scope. Well, since I'm standing here and I have two ears, 
sort of, two years. I heard the snap from back in this area. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. What would you do next? So, I didn't notice the light go bright suddenly or anything like that. I didn't notice the panel light go out as if the fuse blew. The fuse is right here. Let's just check the fuse size. Uh, I'm not, that's a big one. That's a big fuse there. Yeah, I'm not dependent on this fuse. In the power supply over here, I have a fuse. And there's also circuit breakers uh, in here. There's lots of opportunity to, for the power to uh, to go off. This is a one amp fuse. It's a one amp slow blow fuse. Okay, one amp is not ridiculous by any means. It's small, if anything. I would think. Does it say with some chance what size fuse on here? Nope. Wow. Okay, now the great thing is I actually have the operating manual for the scope. Kipling Electronics. Kipling is a, uh, well, it says Rexdale, Ontario. Kipling's a very significant road in uh, Toronto, the Toronto area. Authorized parts and service for Ampex, Alltech, and ICO. 2291 Kipling. There it is back there again. Hey. Hicksville. 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 So I'm looking at this for the first time. I haven't even paged through this yet. Oh my gosh, lots of writing. I think it's going to say in here, and if you hear a pop, then it's probably resistor 41. I don't think it's going to say that anywhere. We do have the oscilloscope, and it looks pretty simple, doesn't it? To me, this is a pretty simple looking scope. Um, yeah, so what, what do you do now? Uh, so that pop was something, I, in, in my thinking, let me turn the power off here, that pop was something, some kind of high voltage sparking over. Now if we left the set on longer, uh, whatever the voltage may have risen up and popped over again. There's a couple of adjustments right back here. Um, it could be popping, it, it, yeah, well it could be anything. could be anything. could be internal and a component like that. That was a pretty clear snap. Could be from something laying somewhere. It shouldn't be. I don't see anything. Should we try it again? Give it another go. This time we'll I'll, I'll douse the lights in here, and we'll do it in the dark, and see if we can spot the snap when it goes. That's a crazy sounding idea, but I think that's the best idea. I think it was back in here. Could have been almost anywhere. Could have been down underneath. And the directivity of my hearing is, is really bad these days. So I, I could have heard it coming from somewhere. It came from somewhere totally different. What if we lay it down? Oh, don't bang it down. Lay it down. Try, try to see as much of it in the camera as we can, much of the componentry. Uh, I should probably be looking back this way, though. But we can't look here and look here at the same time. Look here. Okay, power's off. Switch is on. I'm going to try this again. I'm going to darken everything down here. Uh, so let's do that. How dark? I can get it completely dark in here. Dangerously dark. Okay, now 
the one thing I cannot darken down is my computer screen and a few blue lights. That's okay. That's good. I can see enough here. Okay, so we're going to stare at that thing. I'm going to apply the power again, and we're going to hope we see something somewhere. This is crazy. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that light. <laughs> well, we're going to have to tolerate it. Watching now. Got to stay close enough I can hit the switch here. This is scary. Waiting for it to catch fire. Maybe whatever it was, it blew away. imagination that light just get brighter. Well, you can't tell. The uh, thing about using cameras is they compensate for light settings. It makes oh. Well, nothing's snapping now. Okay. Be laying it on its side. Has somehow shifted something? It's not very likely. Okay, power off. Power off. Lights on. Oh, maybe the camera was right out of... Uh, get powers off? Yes. Let me tip this back up. Carry on. See, it snaps again. Good. <laughs> Try to catch it then. Okay, so this is vertical position. This is intensity. This is what I'm looking for. Intensity and the focus, Put the focus in the middle. Now, vertical and horizontal positions should be in the middle. So really good hope that dot will show up here or maybe a line. Ready to go again? Okay. Once again, this is, this is low voltage. This is also low voltage being supplied to this. Here we go. Once again, just what is the supply voltage? 60 volts right now, 65. So that would cause all the voltages inside to be reduced, including the high voltage for the, for the CRT. 75 volts, very low. Maybe if I hit it with the full supply voltage, whatever that arc or pop was will, will come back. Okay, so now could it be that there's not enough voltage here to make the screen work? It's possible. And at, at the reduced voltage, it takes a long time for tubes to heat up. So we'll give it lots of time. Um, the, heater, the heater in the CRT is visible. Okay, we'll crank up the intensity. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, that was interesting. That sounded like it was up towards the front. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go much further with this oscilloscope here. Because uh, I'm scared. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I was turning up the control here. I seem to have control on it with my hand. Anybody see anything? I didn't see anything. Here we go again. Ooh, cheapers. 
Well, I was able to turn the intensity all the way up that time. Nothing happened. Intensity up all the way. You see nothing appearing on the screen. Vertical position, horizontal position. We're still operating only with 670 volts supplied to this. Probably, it's probably not enough to make it operate. Was that snap the same snap every time? Was it more than one thing snapping in here? I can raise the voltage higher. Um, yeah, you're not seeing much here except piles of reflections. Uh, I can do this It'll be a little better. Still nothing on the screen. Well, if you raise the voltage, chances are whatever that popping is is going to become a continuous, continuous thing, and then the continuous thing is going to burn something up or start a fire. That was a pretty good snap. It sounded like something with a, a substantial charge in it. It's possible it's coming off the CRT itself. Now, some of these guys get their high voltage. Uh, connected to the side of the picture tube and the voltage is actually you know goes to the front of the tube others the voltage comes right from the back it's just another pin on the back uh, TVs have very high voltages old TVs color TVs in particular up around 28,000 volts in that range maybe a little less they don't want to go much higher because the electron striking uh, the glass can generate x-rays if you give enough electron volt energy to the electrons flying down the tube. Same same thing in here except I don't think the voltage is anywhere near as high. It's probably, I'm guessing, two, three thousand volts on the screen. Well, it's not acting up. I'm letting time pass by here. Let's go for uh, a little higher voltage. The light is burned out. Yes, the light is burned out. So this light is operating. But there's another light to light the graduate graticule up here. It's not operating. Okay, we're going to jack up the voltage. But I have another voltage control device, which I don't normally use. That's this thing. It's really ideal for doing this kind of work. I'm going to turn down the supply voltage. And then going to screw in another light bulb here. It's going to reduce the dim bulb type restriction quite a bit. So we're still right around 64 volts here. We're going to go up now. Up to maybe around 90. 90. If things should start working. What if things start snapping? What am I doing? I'm hitting the power switch. That in mind. So much of the uh, oh, son of a gun! There we go. I wasn't looking. Chippers, creepers. Where is that? Where is that coming from? Come on, reveal yourself. Okay, I'll fool with the intensity control again. Oh, it's right in the intensity control. <laughs> I saw it that time. I don't know if you saw it or not, but I saw it. Okay, power off. We've seen we've seen the arc. Power's off. We have seen it. I've seen the light. The spark was right up in here. 
right on the back side of the control I'm holding on to. <laughs> Ooh, baby. What is happening here? Okay, I'm going to get the other camera. We'll take a look. So is that the same snap the whole time? Or did we, is there two things snapping? And I'm about to be fooled. That's the coffee break indicator. Telling me to take a coffee break. Yeah, let's do that. I'm going to take a coffee break. Now I'll let any charges in here dissipate. And, uh, and that'll be just a little safer for me to poke around. Okay, so I took a look at the schematic. It's kind of an interesting uh, result here. I'll show it to you. First of all, I hunted down in the parts list for the part called the Intensity Control. R72. And I looked for R72 and I found it right there. R72. Here you can see the high voltage power supply. Here's the transformer and here is the rectifier, here is the filter, here is the output, and here is the control that shorted or pucked right here. So it's getting the full B plus or whatever voltage you want to call this. B plus is probably a right name for it. Right here. Right on this control. Okay, so we know where the voltage is coming from and we also know it's among the highest, probably the highest in the whole set. Right on this control. Uh, you know what? Let's get the other camera. Let's get the other camera happening here. Now, I may have some trouble with the focus on this. So I might have to stop briefly. Correct it. Could have been popping right inside this. This is really like it, the evidence. Sorry about the focus. The evidence of uh, corrosion here is pretty extreme. So exactly what popped over, I don't know. Oh, come on. Could be it's just dirt. Just dirt and it could be very conductive dirt here. It could be like a rust sort of particles in it. If I can kind of put it that way. Is it just too Could have popped to the chassis too. Too much trouble with the focus on this camera here. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to freeze the focus on this camera here. Here we are, frozen. Take care. Just a moment. Okay. Sorry about that delay. Okay. Um, we can go. We can focus this a little closer here. We'll take a closer look at that. Up above, since I put my shop light back on. Oh my gosh. Okay. There, sorry about all that. Okay, here we go. The set is uh, turned off, power is off to it. So what, what am I hoping to see here? I mean, the obvious signs of where it probably arced. I'm just 
there's two wires back there. Okay, I got the wire out. And I'm looking for cracks in it. What's that white spot there? That's light. It's just light coming through. I don't I don't You know, short of observing this very, very carefully and then, you know, causing the short, short of, <laughs> short of shorting it again. Well, um, I, think, I think what I'll try here, uh, because we have not raised this thing up to its full operating voltage yet. Uh, it's, it's, it really hasn't gotten close to it yet. So let's try spraying it with uh, some kind of a, what, what would you spray that with? That would help. Maybe the control is making bad contact and the arc was actually inside the control. I kind of don't believe that. We're going to hit it with this deoxid. Don't really know why. Not sure what else to do here. Just looking at it again, just with my naked eyeballs. Yeah. What about that other wire? So I have two wires stuck, <laughs> shoved in behind the control. Would have been fine, in, you know, when it was first made. I just sort of sprayed it everywhere. Uh, how's this going to help? <laughs> I don't really know honest with you. Let's put a little more right inside. Is this stuff flammable? Danger. Extremely flammable aerosol contents under pressure. The aerosol is exploded. I'm not going to tell you what's in here, right? This is the D5. D5 provides flushing action. Flushing action. Instructions. Turn off equipment. Adjust valve all the way up or down until it clicks into place. What? Adjust valve all the way up or down until it clicks into place. Oh, let's talk about this. Apply a short burst of deoxid onto the metal surface. Operate the part or device to help break up oxides and contamination. Wait a few seconds. Reapply one short shot. Wait two minutes before turning on the equipment for additional protection. Follow with deoxid gold or deoxid shield. <laughs> we got like 16 different spray cans come up. Spray this, spray that. Uh, you know, there's no magic elixir here. The, the, this is not some kind of magic here. I'll tell you what it did do. This went from feeling crunchy, as if the slider's going over top of rough territory. Now it's smooth. So it's probably done the wash away thing. We know there's high voltage here. We know there's sparks here. So we know there's a chance of setting this on fire, and I've done it before. Not with deoxid, with the alcohol. Just using alcohol on a radio. Uh, there shouldn't be any sparks. Okay, we'll assume that was the one and only short shorting spot. We're going to fire it up again. We'll fire it up. <laughs> We're going to set it on fire. Let's set this guy on fire. Okay, so the switch is on, and we're running with uh, more voltage. This intensity is down. Power's in there. 55 volts, 60 volts, 63 volts, 67, 70. The light is very dull here. 70, 
six volts. It wasn't, it wasn't it up around 90 before? How come it's only at 72 now? What's different? Because I was driving it directly from here without the dim bulbs when the pop occurred. Okay, it's not popping at this voltage. And we see nothing on the screen. So, some scopes, when there's no trigger signal, there's nothing on the screen. Other scopes recognize when there's no trigger signal and they will turn off the blanking and allow the, the, the screen to be visible. Like this scope will do that. So the line is always visible even if there's no triggering, but this one may not do that. So in order to make it trigger, I'm gonna set the uh, trigger control to external, to uh, 60 cycles. Now the assumption now is there's a trigger signal and it's triggering. So if there's something to see, we would see it. And it could be, oh, that's the vertical position. That's not the right one. Intensity is the one I want to turn up. Okay, it's up full. We're at 71 volts. Still don't see anything. Maybe it's off the screen vertically, off the screen horizontally, not on the screen at all. Okay, well it's a pretty low voltage, so we're gonna we're gonna do that voltage trick here. Turn this way down. Flip off the dim lights. 50, 65 volts. Crank it up to around where it was before. This is about 90 now. Anything showing up? No, no snapping. Nothing on the screen yet. Spider web on the screen. Density is full. Focus could be so far out we can't see it. It's not doing anything, nothing doing anything, nothing doing anything. Okay, 91 volts, still a little low. So we're going to take it up higher. Take it up to like, uh, by 100 volts, this thing should be operating for sure. And it should even operate at 90 because we're, 100, we're at 107. That's plenty because this is not a go no go thing this is a get brighter get duller thing so uh, again intensity is full nothing is snapping um, what else is possible here that could be wrong flip this to calibrate maybe that's helpful uh, vertical gain we'll turn the vertical gain down to nothing Horizontal gain. We should leave this up. Assuming the sweep at 100% is the right place. Maybe not. Put it in the middle. I can't see how that would help. We still see nothing on the screen. Is it possible my, my trigger deal here isn't correct? That it's still not triggering? Set to 60 cycles, it should be triggering. The uh, sweep speed. So we can sweep selector is all it says. So we're going to go slower. But I imagine it's slower. Gain intensity is full. The hunting with the vertical. I don't think this scope works. I think this is what we're finding out here. She's a no-go. All my other vintage scopes actually still operate. Uh, how many scopes do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, around nine. <laughs> nine. Not not all this big though. I think I think it's a no go, and uh, far be it for me to try to restore this this guy to operation. Um, it's a single trace scope. Doesn't seem to have very good triggering. Or, you know, uh, sweep selector appears to be not. It's not a precise device. This is more getting a look at the wave shape. Not so much making measurements off of it, off of the scope. Um, and every tube is lit, except that one V3. I don't see that it's lit. What is that tube doing in there? Let's take a look and see if we can find that. That's very strange. One V3. We have to look for a chart of tube numbers. Here they are. So we're looking for the one V one V2. One V2 is, is vacuum tube number eight. Okay. Vacuum tube number eight. Vacuum tube eight. No, that can't be eight, can it? What do I do with my little magnifier? This is not good. Where's my good little magnifier? Walked away with it. Okay, I'm gonna sort this out. Okay, so we're going to use the uh, little camera here to look at the schematic and close up. Vacuum tube number eight. Remember that tube only had three wires going to it? There they are. They're actually using a one, like this is a one volt tube. The, the heater there is running with uh, like 1.4 volts. This 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 tube is commonly found in battery operated radios. It's got no business being in a scope like this. Why would they pick that tube? V8. Am I, am I crazy about it? V8. No, a 1V2. That's you know if somebody said, oh in this oscilloscope there's a 1V2 in the uh, rectifier socket, I'd say, well, get it out of there because that's got no business being in the scope, especially right here. And then, then you see the output, right to R72. Isn't that something? I would never have imagined that. 1V2, I'm gonna look that up in my, uh, my little book here. See what it says about it. Occasionally used as a rectifier in the vacuum tubes. I doubt that. 1V2. 1V. T U V. 1V2. Well, half wave vacuum rectifier. Miniature type used in high voltage, low current applications such as a rectifier in high voltage, pulse operated voltage doubling power supplies for kinescopes. Kinescope, isn't that a uh, TV camera? The very low power required by the filament per permits the use of a rectifier transformer having a small size and light weight. For the curve of average plate characteristics, see page 64. Pulse rectifier service. For operation in a 525 line 30 frame system, so that's more like a well, that'd be the kinescope again. Peak inverse plate voltage, 7,500 max. That little tube. Wow, there's a lot more written about here. A 1V2 requires a miniature nine contact socket may be mounted in any position. The socket may be made of material having low leakage, should have adequate insulation between the filament and the plate terminals to withstand the maximum inverse plate voltage. 
to provide the required insulation in miniature nine contact sockets designed with a cylindrical center shield that is necessary to remove the center shield. In addition, it is recommended that the socket clips for pins 1, 6, and 7 be removed to reduce the possibility of arc over and minimize leakage. The filament is of the coated type and designed for operation at 0.625 volts. The filament is of the coated type and designed for operation at 0.625 volts. I thought it was one. Uh, maybe this is a un very unusual, unusual tube. I always thought all these one volt tubes were just for battery operated radios. But uh, the filament windings on the pulse transformer should be adjusted to provide the rated voltage under average line conditions. When the filament voltage is measured, it is re recommended that an RMS voltmeter of the thermal type be used. Huh. RMS voltmeter of the thermal type. The meter and its leads must be insulated to withstand 15,000 volts, and the stray capacitances to ground should be minimized. So one more paragraph here. The high voltages at which the 1V3 is operated are very dangerous. They put that in bold on here. Great care should be taken to prevent coming into contact with these high voltages. Particular care against fatal shock should be taken in measuring the filament voltage in those circuits where the filament is not grounded. Precautions must include safeguards which definitely eliminate all hazards to personnel. <laughs> Why well, can't say I've ever seen a warning like that in this book? Wow, okay, well there's a big lesson. There's the inside of the tube. If you notice in the tube, they show the cathode, or the heater rather, and the plate far apart. See, see the, the one, they, they show it. It looks like it's far apart. <laughs> uh, it's nothing, Jim. Okay, well, now we know we almost got killed. And the little 1V3 that I would have thought was a harmless little tube is actually a killer, in a killer position in this radio, in this uh, oscilloscope. I've left it on now for quite a bit of time. It's just been on continuously. We still have nothing on the screen whatsoever. Absolutely no screen. So there's a good chance there's no high voltage on the picture too, on the uh, CRT. Any other controls that might be upsetting this thing that I could... Uh, uh, well, we should flip the sink around a little bit. There isn't even a flash going across. Not even a one, one sweep. Well, you know, I have some high voltage voltmeters here that are just itching for a chance to be used. Oh, here's, oh, look at this, a whole troubleshooting guide in here. No spot on CRT screen. Yeah, let's read this. There's no spot on the CRT screen. High voltage rectifier tube. Uh, V8 is defective. Filament leads broken. No voltage on second anode. Spot may be de no spot may be deflected off screen at just vertical position for equal voltages from the CRT pins. So we're telling you you can work these controls and monitor a voltage at the back and know for sure if the dot existed it would be on the screen. But I've kind of done that. Spot should then be centered. If either adjustment is impossible, refer to the vertical or horizontal amplifier sections. No spot on screen. Defective uh, CRT effective uh, tube. Would you believe I have one of these screens? But I mean, goodness knows if it would <laughs> happen to be exactly this one. Uh, retrace blanking and operative. Well, that's the deal. No high voltage. High voltage rectifier tube defective. Filament leads broken. Filament leads to what? To what? Okay, we're going to spin this around. Uh, 
Now, can I figure out which one of these are the high voltage leads? Probably can. Um, does this thing indicate what the voltage might be on there? So we're looking at the back here. We see right, right out of the, the magic tube, right off the far side. Well, we, we know there's high voltage because of the arc over. Perhaps the high voltage isn't getting past that control for some reason. Uh, we, could, we could measure high voltage here, right on that control. I see there's a couple of resistors and a capacitor hooked up right nearby. Uh, yeah, we just poke around with the high voltage voltmeter. Okay, I gotta find my high voltage voltmeter. Okay, never had occasion to use this uh, before. Here's the uh, high voltage voltmeter. 10,000 volts, 20,000, 30,000 volts at the top there. Should I zero it? There, just turn the little screw there. Okay, let's try it. When I'm moving this thing, I'm very, very careful to not reach around when I'm touching parts like this. I'm very, very careful not to stick my fingers around. And uh, I, I might find more high voltage that way. Okay, so we're going to put this on the cabinet. There's a spot. Go down over here. Don't know what to expect. Never use this meter. What, what happened? How come it went like that? I was stuck there. Okay. Let's try this spot right here. Okay, I don't see the meter moving at all. Nice white wire. Let's try this spot. Okay, I don't see the meter moving at all. Let's try well those oh, that's it. There's only two terminals on this control to test. Nothing exciting there. Uh doesn't it seem? I guess they wanted to put the control up at the front, so they had they had to do this. Run the wires up there. This wire going in here somewhere. So that that high voltage, it's got to get to the front of the CRT through some connection somewhere. And just looking everywhere, looking for a connection on the side of the tube. I don't see one. So let's just go around the back here. See, see if we can find something. Hey. Now, what, what, you know, why am I doing this? Just you know, for the sake of doing it, really. I don't, I don't know where it's going to lead. We'll start here. Uh, is there any? Well, let's just do them. Nothing. 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 Does this meter work? I don't know. Because a thousand volts is halfway to the first division on this meter. I mean, it, 500 volts will barely move it. Nothing at all. Well, that might explain well, why there's no. Uh, image because there is no high voltage but 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 we got the big spark the big spark was the high voltage being short at the ground and this thing's running with a, a ground on its high voltage supply right now and that would almost certainly burn something out pretty quick I would think let's let's try this again up here just in case I somehow boot up I don't see any movement on this meter. Oh, 
all these years I've been waiting to use this guy and now I don't know what to make of it. Um, so the high voltage is supposed to come out of that one B3 tube. That's that's right in the middle of the chassis here. And it's supposed to just go up to this control. It's got to be on this wire here. And that means it would be coming into this control here. Is it possible we're reading it like I've got the ground connected to the chassis here? Is it possible that's not really the right way to do this? Not very likely. Just nothing whatsoever showing up. Uh, nothing at all showing up. It's possible that that short, when it went, it also blew out a part somewhere. Again, not very likely. Very, very unlikely. Just spotting all the adjustments in here. There's quite a few. Of course. Um, we've got the arc, but we can't measure any high voltage. How high can we go with this guy? A thousand. We can do a thousand on here. But I'm expecting the voltage to be higher than that. Again, does it actually say in here that I miss it? Um, no, I don't see it anywhere. No. no voltages written anywhere on here a block diagram of the operation. They would be very unlikely to put voltages on this diagram. Oh, there's a whole bunch more parts. Ooh. <laughs> Prices and specifications subject to change without notice. What? Added one dollar for mailing and handling when you order parts. If the power transformer is included in the order, add a buck fifty. Because it's too heavy. Buck fifty. Um, so what about these other adjustments? There's adjustments here. Could it could it be one of these adjustments is a lost contact? It's possible. What about picking up uh, voltage somewhere else in here that I can read on this meter and know the meter works? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, here's another tube. Very carefully now. Looking for any indication on this meter. I'm going to get another meter and really measure the voltages. Find one that's some hundreds. Try it on this meter. And to do that, we're going to try our, our new, our new. Uh, so I looked at this meter in the last video very, very briefly. And I think this is a better meter than I realized even then. Although I realized this is actually pretty good. It's definitely such right on it. Solid state. V, v something, I don't know what that is, micro power, input resistance, DC 11 megaohms, hot diggity dog. This is a nice meter. Okay, we're going to set this to 1000 DC volts. And uh, we're going to get the go. Now there's some breaks in the wires, in this black wire. i got to be careful with this one. We'll clip the brown one right to the scope. So I think I'll put a black one on there so I don't have to hold on to it. Brown? Where'd that come from? Okay. Now, bearing in mind that the 
No, nothing, no, nothing to bear in mind. <laughs> Bearing nothing in mind. Okay, 1,000 volt scale. And is this thing safe? I think so. I think I'm safe. There we go. Anything here? Somebody, anybody? There, we got something. On the 1,000 volt scale, that's 275. On the other side of this resistor, things might be higher. Not really. I love how that's damped. It just, just comes up to the reading. Beautiful. Can we find anything higher down here? And again, that looks like uh, I'm on the thousand scale. Make sure I'm reading the right scale. 275. 275. 275 sounds like the regular V plus, if I can call it that. 275 again. Okay, let's pick one of these terminals that's easy to access. This one. 275 on that. Can we see it on here? I suppose you're not supposed to hold this part of the meter, right? It's supposed to be back here. 275. No indication whatsoever on this meter. I don't think it works. I don't think it's working. Okay, so we read of uh, so many hundreds. What about up here? What about the uh, the output? What about up here? What happens? Okay, this could be this could be too much for the meter. Oh, 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 oh! There was a spark to this. Did I see the meter go backwards? Is that what happened there? Plus minus switch here, which I think is going to reverse it. Hands, hands careful, not touching nothing. All clear. Oh, it's definitely sparking. So we're up over a thousand volts there. Not much though, not much over a thousand. A thousand there with sparks flying. So when I try it with this meter, this thing likes to get stuck. Okay, you won't be able to see this. And the last thing I, I do in life, okay, there's no sparking and nothing, nothing indicating on the meter. I think this meter is not working. Well, that's a high voltage, 1,000 volts. Um, so here's a basic rule of thumb. If you're under 600 volts, the voltage cannot leap any gap. Any air gap is too much, which is why a lot of electric systems uh, uh, change their nature dramatically when you go above 600 volts. And there's a lot of systems that are 600 volt uh, or 550 volt they're trying to stay below this this number. Once you get above it, like a thousand, as, as, as I saw with this meter, the electricity will jump. You want to see that? I think I can show that. The electricity will jump, and so therefore it can jump to little tiny gaps and find its way through dirt and stuff like that and build up a track. And you can have a track discharge, which I think is probably what was going on with that control originally. It was, uh, I could tell some stories about the electric system I worked on where I, I uh, did the, 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 the super short form. Standing in a transformer vault, there's potential for millions of, of, uh, of uh, watts of power in this, in this vault during a short circuit. And... Uh, I hear ticking. That's hard to hear in a vault under the streets in Toronto with the traffic and people walking above. You're, you're, you're down inside listening. 
You go, what the heck is that? I climb up on top of a particular piece of equipment that has many, many spade lugs on the top. The voltage at the top is only 208 volts. I mean, it's, it's not even high voltage. The spade lugs are totally open, big bolted connections, and it's feeding some high-rise building. And I look, and I can see on the top of this piece of equipment all these leaves and dirt and debris that have come down through the uh, vault grates above, you know, where people are walking on the sidewalk. They're kicking dirt down, and it's building up on top. This stuff's supposed to be cleaned away, but it wasn't cleaned away. It kind of turns into a pile of wet, soggy dirt, sort of. And the ticking is a partial short circuit occurring between these, these 208 volt blades, if you like. Could have been 120 volts between them, actually. I, I don't really know how much. And they're a fair distance apart. I took one look at that. I said to my partner, we got to get out of here right away. And we bailed out of that vault as fast as I could. Because for all I know, it was a fraction of a second away from developing a full short circuit. I don't know. I don't want to be there to see that. That would blow that vault sky high. It's on the secondary side. Tremendous amount of current available. Uh, it literally is hooked up to, to Niagara Falls, literally. So, uh, yeah. So j just to finish that story off, I instigated a full inspection with the guys who were supposed to be inspecting that. They didn't know anything about this stuff. Oh my God, I found out, because I was in the engineering department, not in the field service department. I found out these guys, they didn't know anything. They didn't know anything about anything. Nobody ever taught them anything except which end of a broom to drag over the ground. So I showed up and started explaining stuff. And next thing you know, we got reports all over the place. This was out of sorts, this thing, that thing. Who knows how many vault fires I solved. So I'm very proud of this thing. That's why I'm telling this story. Because, of course, nobody knows this happened but me anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I saved Toronto many times. <laughs> From, uh, yeah, vault fires, they happen. If you live in a big city, you've probably seen one. Horrible smoky fire, smoke coming up through a grate in the sidewalk, a fireman running around not sure what to do. Should we put water on it? Should we not? Electrical equipment, all that stuff. Happens in all cities all over the place because no matter how hard you try, you can't stop the from eventually boom. Kaboomy. So that's my story. Okay, what are we going to do with this guy? I think I have done enough. I don't think I can do much more with it without really getting into a heavy duty troubleshooting and I'm not sure I'm interested in doing that maybe somewhere down the road but not right at this time let's cut, cut the power to it the uh, simple immediate problem I seem to have solved and that was the uh, arcing the secondary problem uh, it could be everything from just a defective rectifier to well could be that that little tube no it couldn't Jim. you saw the sparks you saw the sparks turn this off if I don't turn it off battery be dead. Okay, so what's going to happen tomorrow in my shop? I don't know. I have no idea. I'll figure something out. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, I hope you, hope you got a kick out of that and you're not too sad that I'm not going to fix the scope, at least not right away. See ya.